Okay, uh, anyway, uh, so today, uh, this, this hour's talk is Understanding Atlanta's Cop City Training Center Controversy. Um, I am Scott Jones. I am director of this track, but I am also director of Electronic Frontiers Georgia. If this sign did not fall down on the floor, then you can see um, Electronic Frontiers Georgia, and uh, that's our local, actually statewide activist group. Uh, Electronic Frontiers Georgia is really interesting because we have a pretty broad political spectrum. We do have people that identify as conservative, but we also have people who are definitely not conservative. And so we cover the ranges, and being uh, head of that group requires a certain amount of diplomacy. <laughs> um, but it's also, uh, may need to bring up the levels a little bit. Uh, it's, it, it's also the case that we're all pretty much of the same mind when it comes to surveillance government surveillance that sort of thing we're not uh, not real comfortable with it so um so w we are pretty much of the same mind on that um i'm going to ask uh jose to introduce himself at this point uh my name is jose i am uh i'm in uh, staff at the electronic frontier foundation i work uh mostly on domestic issues with local groups across the country including in the colonies and uh, indigenous territories um not everything nearly that i say today will be uh, the position of my employer my employer has not taken a position on cop city um and uh so i want to uh, explicitly state that i may occasionally try to cover my shirt but i probably won't cover it often enough um when i'm giving my individual uh, uh, perspective. Nevertheless, if you do, uh, if you are uh, in a local group anywhere in the country that does tech uh, kinds of issues of any sort, not just around surveillance and policing, uh, please feel free to contact uh, me at jose at eff.org um, and reach out to us uh, to consider affiliating with the Electronic Frontier Alliance, of which EF Georgia is a member. Okay, and if you are interested, uh, in signing up for the Electronic Frontiers Georgia mailing list, there is a sign-up sheet in the back, and we may still have a, still have a few st free stickers back there if you're, if you're interested in that. Um, I should get started by saying uh, kind of where I am. Uh, I bought a house in uh, Atlanta in uh, 2009, and I'm in DeKalb, Atlanta. If you, if you live in Atlanta, you know that part of it's in Fulton, part of it's in DeKalb. So I'm in DeKalb, Atlanta, and uh, my house is actually about four miles from the uh, Cop City Training Center site. So uh, there's this kind of narrative that everybody who's opposed uh, to Cop City is, is from out of town or out of state or something like that, and I don't think that is correct. So, um, and then I, I could state real quickly that I was born here in Atlanta, um, except that I live up north, and I've lived up north my, almost my entire life. Uh, and so my apologies, my great profuse apologies if I get the cab wrong occasionally, because uh, we have them in Chicago and New York and they're pronounced differently, so. <laughs> so at, at this point, um, Jose, you were going to give a background talk on police and policing and the uh, preceding struggles. Yeah, I just kind of, um, starting with the question of police and policing, because I like to situate things a little bit in the definition of at least myself, not uh, you know, Scott certainly doesn't co-sign this, um, but I want to um, begin uh, quickly with uh, where I position myself, which is that I believe that police were created, modern policing was created um, to control uh, the working class, which is the vast majority of us. Um, if you don't have a ver if you don't have a significant small business, um, and you or you're not a high up manager, or you're not an owner of a large business, you're probably a member of the working class, just like me, uh, regardless of your profession, your degree, um, or anything else to that effect. Uh, extent and especially uh, modern policing comes into view when there are more unemployed workers when there are more um, when there are uh, slaves who refuse to be slaves uh, and when you know slavery ends and a lot of people no longer have jobs or um, or otherwise are kind of destitute then policing becomes kind of a social control mechanism on the other hand, of course, uh, we are told that they are here to preserve law and order, and the main form that that takes is to investigate crimes after the fact. Um, although, uh, in this tech age, uh, and we will discuss this perhaps a little bit um, later, there is increasing attempts to use algorithms and data um, to engage in predictive policing, which is uh, the police uh, harassment, police increase in encounters um, and interactions with, uh, with citizens and civilians who have, in many cases, committed no crime whatsoever, but their data suggests might in the future uh, have the probability of doing so. Um, 
so there's a lot of uh, a lot of context, but I want to give a couple of uh, key pieces of context for what was happening in Atlanta. Um, can I get a show of hands of how many people are from Atlanta metro area? Okay, you guys can all correct me. You know, feel free to correct me. I am uh, coming in from outside, and I'm not going to um, make any bones about that. Um, but uh, so that's a very good that's a very good number. So. Um, First, I think it's, it's important to talk about uh, use of force. Uh, there had already been a number of, of police uh, homicides of uh, residents of Atlanta and the Atlanta metro area in the years before the George Floyd uprising, but in, uh, in mid-2020, uh, there was a very notorious case um, in which uh, an individual, Richard Brooks, was sleeping in a car outside, uh, allegedly outside of a Wendy's. Um, the police showed up, creating an encounter, right, creating an interaction that didn't have to have happened, uh, and then, uh, you know, tested him, you know, for, for alcohol uh, and uh, increased um, and, uh, uh, you know, increased the length of the encounter and increased the severity of the encounter um, until they attempted to, they claimed that they attempted to arrest him and then shot him to death. Uh, he was unarmed as far as I know, uh, you know, even if he had not been unarmed, this is an open carry state um, and uh, that's important to, to, to mention. So after that, there were protests, there were large amounts of protests. You all know this better than I do, um, although we were protesting in other parts of the country as well, and Rayshard Brooks' names was one of the ones that we were, that was on our mouths. And, uh, you know, of course there was, uh, you know, the, the, the um, burning down of the Wendy's. Uh, I think a man's life is much more important than a, than a corporate chain or even a small business, um, as many small business owners will tell you after uprisings uh, and rebellions in their own cities around police brutality. Um, but in any event, uh, you know, there were so many protests that uh, out of character, the, the response to the, the killing of Rayshard Brooks was out of character for the city. Usually the mayor doesn't say anything, whoever the mayor is. Usually there is no accountability for the officers. In this case, initially the police chief resigned at, at some point. Uh, the mayor uh, called for an uh, overhaul of the use of force policies. The uh, shooting uh, officer was uh, fired initially, uh, and then uh, he and the uh, other officer that was on the scene who was uh, put out on leave um, were uh, investigated and prosecuted, uh, and uh, the DA uh, then uh, left office. There was a new DA, and they dropped the charges. Um, and the officer was reinstated, as far as I know, with full back pay, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know the extent of the change of, of use of force policies by the, the Atlanta Police Department, um, but they uh, have continued to, to shoot unarmed, usually black men, uh, including, uh, including an individual um, as recently, uh, a 62-year-old individual as recently as less than a month ago. Um, at the same time, the, uh, there have been a series of other kinds of uh, uh, crises in public trust of law enforcement, as you could say, in Atlanta, um, including in the case of the Fulton County uh, jail system, which, uh, you know, as was mentioned, 90% of, of Atlanta approximately um, lays in uh, Fulton County. Uh, and so there was a case, uh, for example, in 2019 against uh, the Fulton County Sheriff's Office for abuse and torture and, and, and misconduct against uh, mostly women and, uh, uh, with mental illnesses in their facilities. Uh, they finally uh, uh, entered a settlement in spring of 2022, and uh, there were investigators that went in in the spring of 2023 and said that the abuses and misconduct continue so much that they filed a for uh, for uh, for com um, contempt by the sheriff's office, uh, and as far as I know, the most recent death in uh, the sheriff's office is as recent as July, um, and that was a, uh, a, a I think a young black woman. So um, you know, so there's there's a crisis of trust, but I, I often think that when we think about community trust in police, 
that's a problem, you know, that's a, a problematic starting point, and that's why I wanted to begin with how I define policing a little bit, just so that you know where I'm coming from. Um, because this is arguably what police are here to do, and it's certainly what police do across the country, uh, across the decades, regardless of reforms. There was a series of commissions and, and, and uh, reforms across the country in, uh, in the 60s and in the 70s, and they, the police departments were able to wrap this into their, their overall um, uh, models. Um, at the same time as uh, murder rates have gone up and down, we will only hear that they go up if you, if you listen to the police foundations, the police unions, um, and uh, the corporate media who often supports them. But, the, but homicide rates have actually gone up and down. I think overall crime rates in Atlanta have actually started to go, have, have been going down. Uh, but that's not what we hear about when there is, when it comes time to talk about funding the police. Um, generally speaking, uh, they cherry pick numbers, they cherry pick the years where, where uh, higher homicide rates and violent crime rates um, have been uh, increasing when they go to the city council and request more money um, for the budget. So uh, of course, you know, community organizations and activists started uh, arguing to defund the police across the country, and I know that that was one of the, I think that was one of the slogans here in Atlanta as well, uh, but that didn't happen. There hasn't been a defunding of the police anywhere. Um, in fact, uh, one of the things that we'll talk about a little bit later, there has also been uh, auxiliary private uh, sponsorship of police operations, and in the case of Atlanta, more so than almost any other city in the country, uh, private entities that actually engage in policing operations uh, without any of the transparency and democratic accountability that you would have if you had to go to the city council for that kind of funding or for those kinds of operations. But we'll get into that in a little bit. So, um, you know, at, at one, of the, one of the examples of that, that that we'll talk, I'm sure, about is the, I, I said yesterday, 11,000 uh, public and private cameras are part of the Loudermilk Operation Shield uh, Video Integration Center, which is uh, run and administered by the private Atlanta Police Foundation. However, last, uh, last numbers that I can actually see, it's about 13,000, um, which also includes uh, automated license plate readers, um, which also, you know, the, the system includes automated license plate readers and software for predictive policing that I was mentioning earlier. So, you know, into this, we kind of, uh, we, we have this lack of, of, of an accountable police department, and then we have these private entities that engage in police operations that have fewer channels of transparency and accountability. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think uh, Scott will say that they do have training facilities for law enforcement in the city of Atlanta at the present time, but they instead said, well, we want more <laughs> training facilities. We need to modernize. We'll talk about kind of the reasons behind it in a bit. But, the, but Cop City, the Atlanta Public Safety Training Center, um, is a sprawling planned facility in a protected forest in DeKalb County, DeKalb County. Um, and, uh, and uh, so DeKalb uh, County's uh, uh, South River Forest, it's very beautiful. I've, you know, done a few tours of it since I've been in Atlanta this, this time around. Um, and uh, they are taking uh, allegedly about 80 uh, acres of land for this fairly sprawling facility that will include uh, mock setups of apartment buildings and uh, and uh, private businesses. I think the, the lease is owned by a private entity, uh, again, the Atlanta Police Foundation, and as far as I know, the lease is actually for 380 acres, so there is the prospect of a significantly larger uh, facility. Um, I don't know the latest number on what the what the number they're claiming is. I think it's still 80, uh, 80 acres. Um, and uh, the, the facility is, you know, we'll, we'll get into a little bit of like what they claim, but they do claim that this is um, going to be a larger than just police facility. It, it will be other emergency response personnel. They do say that it's going to include fire, uh, firefighters, and I believe the fire department does back you know, the, the project. Um, and uh, opponents, I think one of which there are probably a lot of in the room who could speak to this better than I, um, would also point to the fact that there are going to be law enforcement agencies from outside of Atlanta and even outside of Georgia that will also be trained in the facility. So when we talk about uh, you know, whether or not people from outside of Atlanta get to have a perspective on this, 
my New York Police Department might be sending troops down to here to get trained in how to beat me up up in New York. So let's just be clear that this is something that is actually part of a national scope. There is also, and we'll talk about this I think a little bit later, um, there was a police, a fairly large police academy uh, that was created up in New York, up in Chicago, um, and there was similarly a very strong campaign against it. They have opened that up earlier this year. And similarly, there are uh, police uh, personnel from not just outside of Chicago, but outside of the United States that are being trained in that facility. So, so when that movement was pushing for about four or five years against what they called Cop Academy, again, this was not just a Chicago issue, right? Um, any more than, than Cop City is an Atlanta issue. Um, and then uh, before I hand it back to, to um, Scott, um, Sorry, I have not had my coffee yet today. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll hand it back to, to Scott to give a little bit of timeline, um, and uh, I might, you know, add some, some pepper some things in afterwards. Yeah. So, um, I yeah, you, you got started with basically what is the Cop City, and uh, we wanted to. I wanted to clarify that the name came from um the part of the training facility which was kind of like a mock city a mock town it may have been taken out of the plans but the one of the problems that we have o officially it's still in the plans officially it's still in the plan okay so uh we were getting regular postings and regular updates uh from the atlanta police foundation on what the plans were up through about august of 2022 since then they haven't posted anything and we know that they added another 35 million dollars to the budget and what that money's going for i don't know <laughs> you know so so we're not getting communication as to, to to are we getting value you know what are they asking what is the money for where are the plans today? Um, are we getting value for, for dollars spent? Uh, and to add to that, uh, I, I should mention that two, that originally it was about um, a $90 million price tag at, at some point, two thirds of which was going to be paid for by the Atlanta Police Foundation, which is private money again. That largely comes, we'll talk about the Atlanta Police Foundation, but largely um, overwhelming comes from corporations, including many corporations that are not based here in Atlanta. Um, and. Uh, and then there was another $31 million uh, that was going to be, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later as well, um, that uh, was going to be fit, uh, the bill is going to be fit by the city of Atlanta. There has been massive opposition to um, Atlanta putting uh, those $31 million in public funding uh, into, the, into Cop City. But as far as I know, the Atlanta uh, Community Press Collective has argued that they, uh, they believe that the public funding, even though it was passed for $31 million, will be inflated to over $50 million. Okay, quickly over the, uh, to go over the timeline. Um, so we had protests in 2017 after, uh, after uh, Trump took office, um, and that is reportedly around the time that Atlanta Police Foundation started formulating the plans uh, for this center. Um, and we had the shooting of Rayshard Brooks uh, protest, uh, the burning of the Wendy's that was in 2020 and it added a lot of urgency. Uh, the police chief resigned um, and then uh, the mayor at the time, Mayor Bottoms, did not run for re-election in 2021 and was a one-term mayor. Um, the plans for the training center were discovered by journalists in 2021. Uh, the city council took its first public vote on the cop city uh in september 21 despite strong opposition and passed an initial measure um protesters began occupying the site in 2022 to uh forestall any uh construction activities uh there was a police clearing operation in early 2023 which resulted in the death of uh, manuel Turan, who was also known as tortuguita um and then we had a bail we had the arrest of individuals uh, organizing a bail bond fund in Kirkwood, which is not that far from where I live. It was uh, uh, Adele McLean, uh, Marlon Scott Couts, and Savannah Patterson. Uh, June 2023, uh, we had uh, another vote in the city council, uh, additional funding, uh, bonds were floated for the training center, which means that uh, we're officially going into debt. Um, to uh for the project and i believe the vote was was it i believe it was seven to four seven to four so uh that's kind of the balance of of 
um, where we are with city council uh, from a political perspective. Uh, and a petition was launched in June 2023, which is based on the Georgia referendum law that Georgia has a, a law um, where uh, citizens can, uh, can basically constitute a referendum by getting a certain number of signatures on a petition. And, uh, and with the referendum, they can, they can shut down things that they think are, um, that are not good that politicians are doing. It's another, supposed to be another check and balance on politicians. And this was actually used successfully to shut down a spaceport on the, that, was, that was to be built along the Georgia coastline. That was uh, to com compete, basically to compete with Cape Canaveral. So the neighbors didn't want that. They um, successfully uh, mounted a referendum and shut that down. Uh, the referendum signatures were originally to be delivered on August 21st. And I haven't heard much from it lately, so maybe somebody here has an update on that. But uh, I have an update. Um, that uh, that has been available. Uh, I know that uh, I was uh, I was out there and I was signing it way back on June 30th. So I wanted to do that before July 4th. The date's been extended because originally it only applied to the city of Atlanta, and um, uh, uh, some of the protesters went to a judge and were able to extend the scope of the uh, petition to DeKalb County. So uh, some additional time was allowed so that people around the center in DeKalb County could actually sign the petition as well. And that's kind of where we are today. So um, there are actually uh, some arguments for the center. Uh, these are not in any way an endorsement. <laughs> but I think you need to, for completeness, I need to go over uh, what these arguments are, and we can talk about it, uh, whether they're valid or not. Uh, but the existing facilities that we have in the city of Atlanta are dilapidated. We have no facilities at all for firefighters. Um, this is um, supposedly free money from the private sector, which would save taxpayer money. Um, and then we have something called the Less Crime Act. So the Less Crime Act is um, a Georgia, it's, it's a Georgia law which allows tax credits for those who give to private associations such as Atlanta Police Foundation. Um, so that's supposed to be a good thing. Um, we've had, uh, definitely have recruiting issues uh, for the city of Atlanta Police Force, but I've talked to my city council person and quite frankly, every department in the city is understaffed and if you look across the state probably every police department or just about every police department is understaffed so understaffing is a broad problem across all government um, pretty much in the state it is not specific to the Atlanta Police Department so the argument that it's here specifically to fix a problem that's only in the police department I don't think that goes very well um, the other thing is that the 911 facility, uh, we have inadequate facilities for 911. So it's been proposed to move um, the 911 center uh, down into uh, the Cop City um, facility, which would add something else down there, I guess, which would uh, further extend and keep it in place. Uh, the main problem is with that, from my point of view, is that's essentially in a, a, a flood control district, uh, the area around Entrenchment Creek, it's basically uh, right across from Entrenchment Creek Park. And the whole part of, the whole point of that park is to protect the surrounding neighborhoods from flooding. And I was here back in the 90s when Hurricane Opal came through. So I'm not looking, I'm not really looking forward to having a 911 center that's in a flood control district in the middle of a hurricane. I just don't think it's a great idea, but, um, these are supposedly the arguments for. Um, I'm going to send it over to Jose for, for the arguments against. Uh, I'll, um, I will mostly uh, leave that for Q&A because I feel like uh, I'd be mostly preaching to the choir. But I do want to um, speak to, first of all, the, uh, the point that, that uh, Scott made that this was initiated after 2017 um, and that the press found out about it um, after 20, uh, 2020. And aside from just, you know, protests over, uh, over Donald, you know, Trump's election or anything else like that, there had also been a series of protests ever since 2014 and the Ferguson uprising um, that, that catalyzed protests all over the country uh, around uh, police racism and violence. Um, and the, you know, so, so the reason for this 
um, being around crime, well, crime uh, uh, has been dropping in Atlanta since at least 2009, um, despite some cherry-picked numbers here and there by law enforcement agencies. But on the other hand, uh, we have seen protests, we have seen uprisings, and uh, people have said that you know they're going to fight back against police racism and violence by any and all means necessary at certain points. This then seems to me that in timing, it is a counterinsurgency move, right? It is not principally about crime. It is principally about controlling the population of Atlanta. Um, and that's why the funders are not necessarily uh, the, the voters of Atlanta. They came out in the largest numbers um, in, I think it was May, in, in March. Um, of this year uh, for the longest city council meeting uh, public comment section in the city's history. So the, the, the public has a lot of opposition against it and obviously the, the movement against Cop City um, is banking on the fact that the majority of voters will vote against, the, the, uh, against Cop City. However, um, on the other hand, the funding of it is overwhelmingly coming from corporations. Wells Fargo uh, uh, had been pulled back their funding because of a campaign by Color of Change, but they remain on the board of the Atlanta Police Foundation, for example, as do all of the other board members and, and uh, the vast majority of the donors coming from real estate firms, including real estate developers that have been accused of gentrification, uh, uh, corporate law firms, no offense to any corporate law firms in the room, um, as well as banks, retailers, communications companies, many of which actually engage in contracts with police, uh, police departments um, over, uh, over um, surveillance equipment and technology. Uh, and so, you know, I would, I would posit that that is the, the, the crux. Look at who the friends of Cop City are. It is corporations, whether or not they are corporations that have committed crimes in the case of Wells Fargo, creating millions of false accounts for its own account holders. That is a massive count of fraud, and nobody at Wells Fargo was put in prison for it. However, if you jump a turnstile here in Atlanta, uh, you don't have turnstiles, I know, but if you jump those things, and I've seen people jump them in other, in, in other cities, you'll go to jail. So that's, uh, that's a few dollars um, of your theft that you go to jail for, but Wells Fargo goes scot-free. Uh, and Cop City is very clearly pointed uh, at policing towards working class and poor communities, um, and especially black communities, in Atlanta, which uh, many have long argued is the black metropolis, the black mecca. And people all across the country look to Atlanta as a place where you know, black business owners, black institutions are thriving in some cases um, and exist in, in many cases. So, you know, this kind of policing is going to be directed at the very communities that, that comprise many of the institutions and the customer bases of the things that make Atlanta great to so many people. Okay. Uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, go back to Electronic Frontiers Georgia um, and the, the group that I'm heading up and uh, there are plenty of concerns that people have with Cop City, but I wanted to emphasize Electronic Frontiers Georgia, Georgia's biggest concerns. We're concerned about the testing, development, and training of surveillance and carceral tech, that if, it's, if, if Cop City is built as envisioned, it may become a, tra a training ground and proving ground for, for uh, new systems that uh, are more concerned with, with profit than justice. We already have um, many vendors in the area, uh, including uh, Flock, Fusus, and Italatrix are three that I know of and that I track, uh, and there will probably be others on the way. This may become a, a, a testing and proving ground for that. Also, there's no particular law that keeps the, 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 the people who are on the board of Atlanta Police Foundation, there's no law that prevents them from investing in the companies that are building the surveillance systems. So you get to, to to, to the possibility of a vicious circle here. Uh, there's nothing that prevents that. And we also know for a fact, I work with other uh, groups that are doing um, advocacy, and we know for a fact that Atlanta Police Foundation is being used to circumvent the Georgia Open Records Law because um, a lot of times the, uh, we'll ask for some information from some particular agency, and they'll say, well, Atlanta Police Foundation uh, has done that, so it's not a, not a matter of public record. And uh, there was a court case in Chicago where their police foundation was, was sued because they're acting as a government, essentially they're acting as a government agency or, or um, on behalf of the government and they were sued uh, so that they would become subject to that open records law up there in Chicago. And we, we are 
uh, talking with people about uh, uh, about a, a possibly some litigation to do the same thing here, but whether that happens or not remains to be seen. But I, uh, it should I think it should be done either by legislation, litigation, or some uh, combination. But I think probably uh, that you'll, we'll get a better, more of a fair shake if we start with the the litigation path, although that can be a long and winding road. Um, but I did want to bring that up. So the the the, um, the surveillance uh, uh, industry is really one of the greatest concerns that Electronic Frontiers Georgia has with that. Um, so Jose, I wonder if you could cover a little bit about the movement against Cop City and how it's been treated from a First Amendment perspective with RICO and and how dissent has been repressed. Right. I'll, I'll touch on this briefly, too. I think I was, there's some people in Q&A who could probably uh, cover this better than I can. So I'll just kind of give a little bit of an overview um, from, uh, from what I understand, um, and then people can come into it. But just to, to add to that, again, the principal funder, and we'll go into this, is the Atlanta Police uh, uh, Foundation, which also administers, again, the Loudermilk uh, Video Integration Center, um, which uh, brings together uh, for example, Flock ALPR's uh, automated license plate readers um, that surveil your whereabouts across the city and in the in into the suburbs as well, um, along with 13,000 cameras and a predicting policing model. So it is very clear that they're going to use Cop City uh, as a as a training ground for surveillance and, and their tech um, policies as well. It's not going to be simply uh, a, for for beat cops or for for uh, for dealing with dangerous situations, so called. Um, so you know uh, the the uh, the revelations around um, Cop City largely came into play in 2021. Uh, there, uh, I, you know, I personally, there were some activists who came to EFF and to um, other groups that I've been associated with that, uh, you know, kind of asking, you know, what's going on, and some of them started to go to Chicago uh, to, to talk to some of the folks who were working on Cop Academy, um, but a lot of people were simply opposed because there had already been protests against police violence, against police racism, as we discussed, um, and they nevertheless, uh, the, the Atlanta Police Foundation and the city nevertheless started started to prepare um, to go into the forest to do uh, clearing of um, really beautiful forestry. If you are not from Atlanta and you have enough time, it's worth um, going down and kind of giving a drive around. The area is all blockaded at this point. But before it was blockaded, uh, there had been protests, there were actions, and people got arrested. And in response to that, as it became clear that people's protests were not going to be um, sufficient to, uh, to at least get the Atlanta City Council to consider taking a pause on this, uh, protesters did what a lot of protesters have been doing for decades through Earth First actions, which I've been a part of in the past, past the statute of limitations or already prosecuted, and uh, in a number of other cases around Cop Academy in Chicago, um, they engaged in, oh, and, and around Occupy Wall Street, let's, let's recall that one. Um, they engaged in some levels of blockage, tree sits. Uh, these are nonviolent actions. These are completely, um, uh, th they may be considered to be illegal, but it was public land. So this is at least, at minimum, a gray area. However, the city uh, and uh, the state government both considered this criminal acts. They treated it as criminal acts, whether or not uh, it actually was, because it was public land, because it was a public park. Um, and they went in uh, a few times uh, with raids to attempt to push back the crowds. The crowds started to have, you know, kind of protests and some some level of um, social events, food not bombs, and other kinds of free free food uh, programs, uh, free. Uh, you know, free kind of um, thrift shop uh, programs for, for community members who wanted clothes or wanted to donate clothes to each other or other, or other uh, stuff. And uh, this, uh, you know, all got to a head in a raid in January in which Tor Tortuguita, who I, I think uh, Manuel Terran is not their dead name, I think that's just their legal name. I don't know that uh, they had completely changed, but, but they went by they, them pronouns regardless. Um, they, uh, you know, I, I have mutual friends of Tortuguita. Uh, from everything that I understood, this was a very nonviolent person who constantly uh, talked about peace. Now, 
I'm not gonna, I'm not actually going to sit up here and advocate nonviolence, but I'm going to say Tortuguita, from what I understand, did advocate nonviolence um, in particular. Uh, they, uh, they, there are body cams uh, footage that came out significantly after the fact uh, that showed that they were sitting cross-legged with their arms up. Uh, there obviously were, uh, there was plenty of evidence um, in, I, I don't wanna re-traumatize people who may be in the room, but they were shot to death unarmed. The police showed a picture of a supposed gun. There has been no uh, linkage of that gun, as far as I know, to Tortuguita. Um, and so at minimum, there is a there should be an investigation on the claims that the Atlanta police made, and there should be maybe a halt to the Atlanta police's use of force in the forest. However, there wasn't, right? Uh, Tortuguita, they, they made their claims in public. They showed a picture of a gun that they alleged was Tortuguita's. They uh, claimed that Tortuguita did things that were shown not to have happened on the body cam. And, uh, you know, and then things moved on, right? They were able to start pushing people out of the forest. In response, again, protesters uh, had festivals and, you know, things that were more of a, of a uh, you know, of a festive atmosphere in celebration of Tortuguita and against um, Cop City. There were also uh, people who were very angry and, then, and, and in some cases rebelled. It didn't matter, however, if you were in one of the sites uh, where there was a clash or a skirmish between unarmed protesters or largely unarmed protesters and heavily armed police, or uh, you were in a place that was a festive atmosphere which was perfectly legal in a public park um, where people were playing music and feeding each other and, and uh, having a good time, but you know, in communion with the, with the movement to stop Cop City, because in both cases, there were in, in mainly the nonviolent areas, uh, in mostly these festive areas, these people were arrested. Uh, there, were, there was a terrible arrest against uh, a, a particular music festival um, that was part of the Stop Cop City movement in which a number of activists, um, I think it was a couple dozen activists, got domestic terrorism charges. Um, and over the span of it, there have been over a hundred uh, people who have caught charges. I think it's uh, I think it's over a hundred. I think it's about twenty nine or so who have gotten domestic terrorism charges. Uh, forty two. Sorry about that. Forty two people have gotten domestic char terrorism charges across three counties. Um, and uh, the the initially the. Uh, the DAs and the state attorney general started to prosecute these as domestic terrorism. So uh, at some point, the, the DeKalb County, DeKalb, I said it correct again? DeKalb. Yeah. Uh, what's De that? DeKalb. DeKalb. There's, there's some debate, so I'm going to go back and forth a little bit, you know? Um, so DeKalb uh, County uh, 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 DA uh, decided not to prosecute um, the charges that were under her purview, I think it was about 42, uh, or no, it was, it was, it was uh, not exactly 42 charges, but it was about 36 people. Um, and they, uh, they, uh, her reasoning was in uh, most part that the philosophies of the state attorney general um, and hers were uh, for prosecuting these cases were completely different. Um, in essence, she was implying that these were political prosecutions, that the use of DT charges were political against them. Now, what is domestic terrorism? Uh, it is usually a state-based definition. There is not, thankfully, a, a full federal designation of what domestic terrorism is because terrorism as a designation means that you can engage in certain operations against uh, against an individual or a group uh, or against certain communications um, that you wouldn't be able to constitutionally. However, that is terrorism only exists currently in U.S. federal law internationally, right? It is not something that a U.S. citizen on U.S. ground talking to another person from in, in the United States can engage in. So you have to at least have one of those things broken up for someone to get a federal terrorism charge. However, states have been really pushing for domestic terrorism charges, and it comes from the Democrats and the Republicans, right? It comes from the Republicans uh, frequently against protesters, Black Lives Matter protesters, anti-fascist protesters, and it comes from uh, from Democrats against, for example, the people who stormed the Capitol uh, on January 6th in uh, 2021. So, you know, uh, there, these domestic terrorism charges, though, at the state level still in, in, in give and engage more investigative powers and tools to law enforcement agencies in the state level and the municipal level. And it also does a, a, a terrible chilling effect because it scares, A, it scares people 
who uh, may have wanted to support or may have supported in the past or may have wanted to go out to a protest from even joining, from, from uh, you know, protesting, perhaps even from signing on to the petition. But I, I, that seems like it might not be true because the, the people who've been getting petitions uh, filled have been doing an excellent job from what I understand. Um, so uh, part of an example of that is the raid against the, uh, the, the bail fund, um, which we have a representative of. I hope that you could speak to it a little bit at some point. I don't, you know, don't want to get all of the, uh, the, the details wrong um, right in front of you. Uh, but, uh, but there was a raid on their home. They, uh, they were you know, charged with domestic terrorism charges for doing legal defense fundraising which is something movements of every sort on all sides of the political spectrum have always done, and thankfully they have, or else I myself would be in prison for spurious charges many times in the past. So, uh, you know, my big, big, big respect to community bail funds uh, and legal defense funds of movements of all sorts, of course, um, but they were, they were charged with domestic terrorism charges, um, <coughs> and you know, at minimum, this allows then the uh, gives an excuse for online uh, 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 crowdsourcing uh, apps as well as uh, financial services um, apps to cut their funding, cut their to, to to blockade them and prevent them from being able to fundraise online, which is something that EFF does pay attention to to some degree. We have not uh, joined any litigation on the question in particular, but this is something that we do pay attention to. Uh, this kind of discriminatory practices against movements as well as against you know, sex workers and others um, by uh, finan online financial services. And uh, can I mention the private? I'm not sure. Okay. So, uh, you know, so, so there has nevertheless been a, a series of, of private sector repression against this movement as well, in part under the guise of these domestic terrorism charges. Um, we don't have DT charges. We have money okay. laundering and money laundering. charity. There you go. Still pretty significant. Yeah. Okay, we got about 15 minutes, oh. so yeah. I need to I need to move on to a few last points. I'll I'll uh, so we can move on a little bit to the referendum. Um, I uh, I can't speak to that massively, and I'm and you know certainly we do not take a position on it on this panel. Um, however, uh, after all of this repression, that clearly uh, put a chilling effect on the movement on people who are able to to organize in the streets. And if you take a drive around the park, as I, I did a couple times last week, it is completely blockaded off. Uh, there are uh, sections of law enforcement um, still in large numbers inside the forest, but uh, at you know, for months after some of these raids, there had been legions of police uh, vehicles that were outside of the park um, to prevent any kind of protest. So now it's been blockaded off. Community members still have some operations on the outside of it, but blockades are, for all intents and purposes, uh, it seems to be over. So a lot of activists switched over to doing a referendum, um, and uh, that meant trying to collect 58,000 signatures uh, to get it on the ballot this November, I believe. Um, and the uh, city has responded uh, with a number of practices that some of the officials in the city had previously opposed. So for example, uh, they have changed the way that they count the number of uh, potential people who could sign a petition, which then increases the number of signatures. Um, I think they increase the number of signatures that is required by about 4,000. Uh, and they are engaging in something that is called uh, signature matching. And uh, the mayor had opposed signature matching before he was in office. I think a lot of other uh, officials in the city government also had opposed it, as had the uh, as had you know voting rights advocates like Stacey Abrams and courts in Georgia as well, which had called these uh, often discriminatory, subjective, um, and inexact. Uh, and essentially, what it does is they're saying that if which the, the uh, movement had about 100,000, maybe a little bit more than 100,000 signatures as of a week and a half ago when they were originally ready sub to submit the signatures, that those signatures would be checked by, by a person against signatures that were on file for those folks. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't, you know, A, my penmanship is not that good. And B, if I did sign a petition and I wasn't told that it was going to be signature matched to my license, it wouldn't look the same. 
But nevertheless, and you know, like I said, courts have, 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 have opposed this, uh, voting rights advocates have opposed this, even some of the elected officials who would like to use this have opposed this, and therefore the movement uh, switched gears, announced um, that they were no longer going to, uh, to bring in the signatures a week and a half ago and are now going to bring those signatures in later in September, later this month. Um, and so. Uh, All right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're getting we're getting closer on time. I want to go through a couple of last last points. Uh, criticism of the opposition, uh, the opposition to Cop City. Now, this is in no way an endorsement or, or, or calling anybody out, but I need to go over the points for completeness. Um, I mean, there's been a narrative about it's a very small minority. They're mostly from out of town. There was a study. Uh, there was a, a poll taken by Emory, which pretty much exploded that, which, where they showed probably maybe 45 to 48 percent opposition, uh, which is maybe not quite a majority, but that's very significant. And that has political implications. Um, the other thing, the other um, real um, maybe uh, point that I need to cover as far as criticism of the opposition is that uh, let's, say we, let's say that Cop City is shut down. So what is plan B? Um, so we need to, we do need to do something for the police. Um, the police have a job to do. It's not the position of, uh, I mean, I'm very personally very aware of the, um, uh, of the movement, uh, of, of the, uh, police abolition movement. I'm learning more about it all the time. I'm trying to take the best ideas from it, uh, and learn from that. But for the moment, you know, police have a job to do. They need to be supported at some point in time. I've talked to my city council person, um, and I've, I've learned that uh, basics, th they're basic things like uh, the laptops that they use in the cars are falling apart. Um, really basic things are falling apart. So it's not just a staffing issue. I see some, I see a nodding head here. But um, we live in a very, very rich city, relatively speaking. It's a very large and very rich city that is kind of um, is kind of like a, a, a comedy of, of poverty. We can't, we can't cover the cost of basic things, and yet we want to go out and buy a lot of shiny toys, a lot of shiny tech toys. So I think it's really, this is not just a question of, of money, it's a question of priorities, and I don't think the priorities are in the right place. So, you know, it's not the position of, uh, of Electronic Frontier Storage today to, to shut down the police. We understand that, that there's a job to do, and we need to support them in the basics. Um, and I'm not, con not convinced that, that, that Cop City is necessarily accomplishing that. If you look at the money that's being spent on that, if we could uh, go back and redirect that into more basic things. Um, you're talking about uniforms, squad cars, laptops. Uh, even if they need it, sidearms, uh, really basic things that are just nuts and bolts. And I think a lot of that's being ignored. So that is kind of problematic. Um, I did want to go into, uh, as far as training centers, real quick. I want to breeze through this. Give me a second. I'll also mention that the Atlanta, uh, the Atlanta Police Foundation, which, um, uh, as we've said, is corporate-funded, uh, it has a corporate board. You can check their board, and they have not yet scrubbed the, affiliate, the corporate affiliations of all of its board members. Uh, it has also engaged in, in potentially bad faith operations. Um, for example, running the video integration center, which normally would have to be, you know, would have to come before city council. There could be public comment on, and you could see the budget around, but you can't see the budget around because it is a private entity that runs it. And after the, the killing of Rayshard Brooks and uh, police, and, you know, on a wider scale and the police union um, argued for uh, a blue flu and uh, kind of police protests against uh, any level of accountability for the officers that killed Rayshard Brooks, uh, the Atlanta Police Foundation turned around and used its corporate money to give $500 to each officer of Atlanta um, police uh, as a little bonus, as a little cookie uh, for, for uh, you know, uh, continuing to protect property, but obviously not protecting the lives of Atlantans. Okay, so I want to mention just, uh, I guess, two more things here. Number one is the Georgia Public Safety Training Center. So uh, the city's acting like that there is no alternative, but it turns out that down in Forsyth, Georgia, which is uh, less than an hour and a half away, it's just north of Macon, uh, we have the Georgia Public Safety Training Center, and if we go to training and we go to view courses, um, 
you know, acting officer in charge, active shooter instruction, advanced forensics, anthropology, ballistics, shields. There, there's tons of stuff here that's already available in Georgia. So the question is, why do we need to duplicate that? And this isn't just police, by the way. This is fire, uh, ambulance, all kinds of public first responders are in here. Family violence, family first responder, fire inspector. We've got all these. This is, this, <coughs> excuse me, this facility serves the entire state. I understand it's not just Atlanta, but the question is, why are we not leveraging this? And it's, this seems what we, we're doing seems to do either duplicate what we already have down here in Forsyth, Georgia, or uh, maybe it's not really a training center at all. Maybe it's uh, something else. So, um, you know, I think it's uh, driven maybe by, um, you know, politics, uh, pride, uh, maybe not the best intentions. So I am concerned about that. Um, and also I want to, you know, just talk about the long term and, and the long run, the long term situation here and, and what the, the final goals, uh, goals are. Uh, when I say, uh, let's go, Brandon, I'm not talking <laughs> about Joe Biden. <laughs> I'm talking about Brandon Johnson, uh, the mayor that was elected in Chicago, who is the closest thing that we have to a, a, a police abolitionist in any major city. Um, so what happened in Chicago is that they put up a fight against their training center. They lost the battle, but ultimately, I think they kind of won the war by electing um, somebody who was more interested in justice necessarily than profit. Whether that really works out remains to be seen, because I think there's some mistakes have been made already. Um, there is some controversy already. Whether that will really turn out as well. As, as, as people hope, remains to be seen, but it does give me hope. So um, I think you have to realize if you're, if you're here to be against Cop City or for it, um, there's a long road ahead. Uh, and so I think the real answer, there is a question as to whether this uh, training center will be stopped or not, but I think the, the, in the long run, the real answer is going to be politics. Uh, and political, and, and I'm very fascinated to see what will happen at our next municipal election cycle, which is 2025. Our current um, uh, mayor, uh, Andrew Dickens, was elected in 2021. It's a four-year term, so I think the real answer to the question, obviously the referendum uh, will have a, a say in that, but I think, uh, and that will probably affect the politics in 2025, but the real answer is probably going to be coming down the road in 2025 in the future of what happens at that site. Uh, a lot of that will be determined at 2025. So the question is, will this blow over? I, I don't think it will. Um, and the question is, what kind of effects will it have politically in 2025? Given that um, it's a, it is already an all democratic um, right. you know, mayor and city council and, and majority black, um, then that alone hasn't guaranteed a path to justice. Um, so, uh, it remains to be seen uh, just what the city will do. I would say that if there's a division in the city, it's not so much along political lines. Uh, uh, it may be along age lines because one of the biggest problems you have is uh, convincing uh, the, the older population, the older minority population, which I have in my neighborhood, uh, that there's a real problem because I see a very big generation, uh, generational split here that I would say that there's a generation gap and overcoming the gap across all ages and coming to get, the city really is very divided on this question and, and coming to, to a consensus uh, really is going to have a, a major um, impact on what happens in 2025. But I think that the answer is going to come down in 2025. Um, and so I want to get into Q&A. Is there any final no, no. We've, okay. We've got so very if you have if you have okay. comments, questions, uh, I haven't allowed much time for it, but uh, since I run this track, I can let it run over a little bit. Uh, so if you have questions, please come to the mic in the center, and we'll see what we can do. And uh, what are you thinking here? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Is is has this been uh, well handled? Okay. And so please do rate us in the uh, DragonCon app. Uh, and let us know how you feel about that. But go ahead with the first question. Awesome. Uh, first, thank you guys so much for giving that. I know I live uh, I live here, and I have seen Cop City in the headlines, but haven't really come up to speed on what all is going on, so I really appreciate all the background and all the information. Um, I had two questions. Feel free to take either one as you might like. 
because you guys touched on it briefly, uh, what are some of the things from... <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Gonna, I'm not going to let him finish. Um, uh, what are some of the things that you would take away from Cop Academy that we might be able to do now in the context of where we are with Cop City? And then two, has there been any discussion around, we talked a lot about land and placement and things that are important about kind of the physical location, but has there any been discussion about the programming, who gets to choose on the authority of these things, particularly with the public-private model? What kind of influence do we think we would expect from the city in terms of, well, we can have this type of training, but not this type of training, and so on and so forth? Uh, you know, I mean, in terms of the, the, the second thing, I mean, you know, you, you cannot trust uh, what agencies, private or public, say uh, they're going to do with land, they're going to do with a facility that they're producing, uh, unless you get it in some kind of legal uh, writing, unless there is some kind of settlement, there's some consent decree, there's some agreement of some sort, or potentially an ordinance uh, that stipulates these things and, and, and puts them into law so that they can, so that you can then take them to court afterwards. Otherwise, it is consistently, uh, you know, uh, they consistently go back on their word as they have already gone back on the funding, on the amount of space it might require, um, and as they also went back on their word on in terms of Cop Academy in Chicago um, and a lot of the claims that the police department in Chicago made um, about their about their academy. So uh, I would say that's that is a part of it. Um, because uh, otherwise you can make arguments back and forth, but they will simply, you know, if they decide where they right now say very clearly in one word that they are not going to have military training, they are not going to have training of military weapons um, or militarized equipment or uh, drones or flying devices, they uh, could simply decide to do it and there's not any recourse, right? There's not a single piece of recourse that community groups can do. Um, and I think, you know, the Atlanta Police Foundation uh, clearly needs to be reined in, right? There needs to be something uh, that s suggests, whether by law or by courts, that this is a uh, state actor or behaving as a state actor and therefore needs to be opened up to the same accountability and public comment and transparency um, as the rest of the Atlanta Police Department and the Atlanta law enforcement uh, public sector agencies. Um, I would say that, and I think with Cop Academy, I mean, some of that would get into electoral stuff that I really cannot speak to uh, as a representative of EFF today. Um, even though I've gone off of uh, EFF's book plenty, uh, I, I still can't really speak to that, but I think some of it is a question of electoral stuff. And, uh, and you know, otherwise, they do have a Cop Academy now that has been opened in Chicago. Um, and so, you know, these movements have to be long running, right? As, the, as a lot of people who are veterans of the civil rights movement um, and black power movements never tire of telling the rest of us these things are a marathon, not a sprint. Um, it requires a, a life of commitment and, a, and, a, and um, movements that are, are willing to uh, endure the, the test of time, uh, not just these flashpoints. And uh, so these ad hoc kind of collectives that were created in, in Chicago around Cop Academy, many of them became longer term groups um, uh, that, uh, you know, became institution building uh, for movements and, and for youth groups um, in the city of Chicago. And I would, I would advocate that similarly, a lot of the ad hoc stuff that uh, has come into play here in Atlanta, you might want to think about making it more long term um, if it fulfills a need that isn't otherwise fulfilled uh, by institutions already existing in Atlanta. Do you have any okay. answers to that? Uh, All right. That's, um, yeah. I get, I, yeah, I guess we need to go on to the next question. Hi. It's really cold in here. <laughs> I was wondering about the domestic terrorism charges connected to the music festival. I was just curious about what type of music the bands were playing. <laughs> <laughs> Can anyone else speak to that better than me? Uh, yeah, I, I, somebody, somebody maybe can speak to it. Punk. <laughs> Punk. That's good. <laughs> That's cool. That's good enough for me. Um, and then I was curious and about the, um, the money laundering and um, charity fraud charges um, that were mentioned. Um, I was wondering whether the financials have been disclosed or if that was just speculation that the charges were based on. Um. I, honestly, I cannot speak to that myself. They have 
haven't said anything about what they're basing the charges on other than just in the bail hearing. Okay, thanks. It, it, it would be early in an investigation. I mean, sometimes investigations take years. Um, yeah, I, I think they did bring up charity fraud. Um, right. it, it, you know, the, the, the problem is, I guess, in their, perhaps in their minds, um, if they're pursuing a course of action that, 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 that is in itself illegal, then, then a charity supporting that act activity would be illegal. But it doesn't, it doesn't sound right because that's not normally what you do. You have bail funds for all kinds of causes. You don't normally go after that. So um, it does sound, and, and I, I don't know, it doesn't, the, the First Amendment doesn't actually say, it speak to bond funds, but that, that is in a way, if you look at it in a broad picture kind of way, it is kind of voting with your dollars uh, for a particular outcome. And so I think there, there might, if you stretch it a little bit, there might be a First Amendment argument there. There's, there certainly are in some places. In some uh, states, there are actually some level of restrictions on bail funds because, uh, you know, the idea is that you're not allowed to, to just give money to a bail fund that's going to bail everybody out regardless of any charge whatsoever. But this was a very clear uh, legal defense fund for a specific movement and I think was completely transparent and open about what it was doing and so um, insofar as it could be. And so, uh, you know, I mean, people knew what they were donating to. Uh, the money was going to the thing that people were donating to, as far as I know. Okay. Um, this might be an heretical question. Um, so in the event that um, Cop City does wind up getting approved and these organizations, privately funded, do wind up being able to, div you know, to go through with their plans, how feasible does it become to uh, basically develop counter surveillance, fighting tech with tech. Right. So surveillance. That's a that's a very very exciting question. Um, you know, I I come out of cop watch uh, for decades. Um, I you know it's basically we went around in community based patrols. It was as much community organizing as it was video re recording, but it was videotaping police interactions in the community and police operations in the community lawfully. First Amendment constitutionally protected according to the Supreme Court. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so essentially that was a form of surveillance. It was certainly something that, that there are still lots of cop watch projects across the country, but now there are, uh, it's much more expansive because a lot of that we used to do before smartphones. And now because people have smartphones, people frequently pull out their phone cameras and do that sometimes in an organized fashion and sometimes in an unorganized fashion. In uh, response to a lot of that, the ACLU, the National Lawyers Guild, and a number of other groups have also created apps that you can record things, uh, uh, record police uh, interactions to, that then the video gets uploaded live or immediately. Um, you can also put information about it, but that's especially helpful in situations where people might record law enforcement officers and then have their phones taken away, be arrested, have the, 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 the clip, you know, the, their phone broken at some point. So as it's being recorded, making sure that it's being uploaded, and of course, deleting if there is nothing found, right? You know, nobody wants to collect data where it's not useful, where it's not, you know, going to be used for something, and it's not, and it doesn't actually show anything. And besides that, we don't all have a million, uh, you know, we don't have the biggest uh, server space. So I would say that that is a part of it. I think that, you know, there may be some conversations around drones I cannot speak to. Um, but you know, I think that some of the some of those kinds of operations are possible. I think a lot of law enforcement agencies are also switching over from uh, old school analog radio systems to digitized and encrypted end-to-end uh, -end encrypted radio systems. So that becomes another problem because for for decades, anybody with a with a radio could listen to what police were saying, which meant that if police said something that was uh, any evidence of misconduct, uh, racist, or perhaps they claimed that, you know, where they were going to arrest some youth, that there wasn't charges around, stuff that I, you know, saw when I was uh, engaging in that kind of stuff. We won't be able to listen to that anymore. It will be a clear channel for the, for the police to, to be able to uh, continue to talk. So I think, you know, fighting that uh, kind of thing in the courts um, to make sure that transparency remains uh, is also really, really important because then people can engage in that kind of surveillance, which 
in a perfect world, in a perfect Atlanta, simply means that the Atlanta police are, uh, are just going to do their job, right? The, the job that they ostensibly have. As police often like to say to uh, civilians, if you're not doing anything wrong, you have nothing to worry about. Well, yeah. then police should open up their books. The Atlanta Police Foundation should open up their books. Uh, they should keep their radios open uh, for the public, because if they're not doing anything wrong, they got nothing to worry about. Thanks. Do you have anything to say? Um, well, I guess I will say this um, uh, in terms of the SUS valence. Uh, I, I have uh, purchased a small uh, photographic drone and I am considering using the drone to kind of go up and down the utility poles and look at all the equipment on the utility poles. Obviously not for electric power, but just, just to, to, to try to figure out what the surveillance is because um, I, you can see everything on the pole, but you can't necessarily get up close to it. So uh, with a drone, you can go up and maybe scan. Uh, of course, I don't know how suspicious that would look or not look, but <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll add really quickly on that score. You know, for example, we we uh, can't get information from Customs and Border Protection about all of the surveillance that they have built at the border directly. Like they won't, you know, they won't respond to the FOIA requests and the like. So in some cases, EFF has done a drive along the border to to chart the locations and kinds of towers, surveillance towers. Uh, there are a lot of communities across the country that have attempted to do tours of areas, I'll try to make it fast, um, we'll, we'll have tried to do tours of cities to count up all the cameras and then map all of the cameras. Um, but in a case like this, it would be hard to do because it's public-private. Uh, I think they're also just increasing the number of cameras um, at a frequent pace enough that it's, you know, it's going to have to continue to be updated. But that's another option um, that communities have relied on and that sometimes EFF has also relied on when we can't get uh, information from law enforcement agencies at the federal level. Okay, last question. Uh, it's more of a comment. Uh, sure. Boy, I hear a lot of bias in this whole thing. First of all, I think it's a real mistake to look at the environment and all oh, these beautiful trees and it's such a beautiful area. Go up on Stone Mountain if you look over Atlanta. It's green. Yes, no one likes to see things torn down, but I look around here. This all used to be forest. So to say Cop City bad because we're losing trees, that seems really insignificant to me. I mean, I love them too. Uh, I also have a problem with people going on public land and protesting. It's like these people who are going against uh, the oil industry sitting in the, in the public streets and blocking me. So <clears throat> another thing, Bias, you mentioned something, oh, the cops all got a $500. You said this after pointing out some of the mistakes they made. You imply there that, oh, they're being rewarded for their bad behavior. I think we make a real mistake when we look at the police and we, and we look at the incidences uh, of where certain people are, are, are either people of color or uh, uh, people like me. I'm, I'm called a white terrorist by the President of the United States without any, nobody knows anything about me. And this guy who runs my country, supposedly for my freedom, says I'm a white supremacist. Well, I've given hundreds of thousands of dollars to uh, people of color over my life because I've been a very fortunate, wealthy man. And it really irritates me that we take these, these things that people have done and, and villainize all of them. So anyway, I don't like the bias here. I don't love the cops. I got pulled over in Flowery Branch because I was waiting for my wife outside Publix. And I told the cops, I said, what do you want? You know, he goes, get over there, get over there. Well, I went to court twice. My wife didn't like it. And I won the case. I don't like the police any more than anybody else. But I'm going to tell you, 98% of the cops are doing the best job they can. Let's concentrate on and just calling it cops city. I mean, right there, that's derogatory. Mm -hmm. Let's call it, I mean, definitely, we need to get in here and make sure what they're doing, but I'm a heck of a lot more worried about surveillance every time I pick up my phone. If you think you aren't being surveilled, then get your face out of your right. phone. It's true, you're right. Because you are turning, your, we're all worried about posts and pictures of us walking down the street, yet we'll put our face in this thing and go, oh yeah, I'm looking at porn. Oh yeah, I'm checking the stock market. Oh yeah, I'm doing this. I'm doing that here's my life follow me and they are following me how when's the last time you went and posted something on the internet that somebody didn't that you didn't feel your privacy mm -hmm. was was infected so let's 
let's not love the cops. There's definitely bad cops. And if I lived in a crappy neighborhood, I'd say, would you please bring more cops in? Because those guys over there dealing meth over on the corner aren't making my life better. I see these poor black women who are going to their Baptist churches trying to make a better life for themselves, and they can't even bring their kids down the street. Is it because they're people of color? No, it's because criminals are criminals, regardless if they're white or black. And anybody who thinks right. we're going to change criminals, right. we're kidding ourselves. Or, or, or have badges or don't. I, I really, I so really anyway, appreciate that's, your, you know, your comments. Uh, uh, again, uh, oh, and the last thing about a bias, you know, you take white collar crime in Wells Fargo. Oh, no one was prosecuted. Well, granted, I think that stinks. Right. But to equate that and say, well, then all these people are getting away, these cops are getting away with stuff because they're being sponsored by corporations. I don't like corporations, but I'm going to tell you, everyone goes to McDonald's, everybody goes to Wendy's, everybody goes to all. We like certain corporations. What's this drink you're drinking? Well, that's made by a corporation. So right. let's just keep things. I'm a positive guy. 90% of the world is really good, and I'm tired of being divided from people because I'm a white guy and he's a black guy. I mean, what difference does it make? It really bothers me. So let's, let's give these cops a chance and don't tell them that they're tearing down the forest because right. that's not what they're doing. They're just trying to make life better. the police. I, I, the police. So, you know, generalizations like that, I, just, what is that I appreciate your comments. I just want to. I do want to speak to a couple of them real quick. I do personally oppose domestic terrorism charges for people for for yourself for whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and generally, actually, think domestic terrorism charges anywhere in the political political spectrum give too many uh, too many weapons to prosecutors and to law enforcement agencies. Uh, and I strongly agree with your view on surveillance from phones and private companies. I mean, I work for EFF. We work on that issue constantly. Uh, and, uh, and I would say a, the, a question about the forests. Um, people have been opposing the gentrification uh, and the, the leveling of forests by, other, by companies, by real estate developers, by big corporations, by chains in Atlanta and in other cities all the time. So I, I do want to say that the people who are protesting around Cop City aren't just trying to protect trees from cops. They're trying to protect trees from any big developers <coughs> or giant highways that, that they may deem unnecessary. Um, and you know the forestry might be more important than the highways in their opinion. So you know some of those questions, people really do take you know the, the, the wider view that you have and that you suggested. Uh, you know, uh, and then you know some of the other questions I think that we may have you know some personal disagreements on, and that's perfectly fine. However, protests have to have a place to happen, right? And if public par parks and public forests are closed to them, like where are protests allowed to happen? Where are we allowed to have our First Amendment rights? We should protect First Amendment rights for everybody everywhere, Definitely. right? Definitely. Uh, so, you know, that's just a, a, a little bit of it, but, but thank you for, for hitting those points and for also coming so civil and, uh, you know. And like I say, when, you know, when this guy leaves and, and he looks in the mic, he says, fuck the police, I just go, please. That's just such an insult to my intelligence and everyone's intelligence, you know. I mean, that, that same guy, when he's walking down the street, if somebody puts a gun at his head, he's going to wish a cop were there. I mean, we all want the cops when they're... Thanks, well, I, it's my son. That guy was rude. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, guys. You I really... right in your face. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Love you. Thanks. Yeah, take care of yourself. All right. Thanks. Peace, by the way, I'm right. an old hippie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to wrap it up here. Thanks. Yeah. I'm going to stop the recording. Feel, now. feel free to come talk to us or ask questions or yell at us.